I want to spend a little bit of time. We talked about growth, long-term, short-term growth, and I want to make sure you, you're you, you're exposed to these concepts of economic modes and Porter's five forces. You should see Porter's five forces in um, uh, I don't know your strategy class or maybe in in your um, marketing class, but um, I want to make sure you see it from a financial standpoint. I think the fact, especially finance majors, they see this in a strategy class or marketing class and say, oh, that doesn't apply to finance. These concepts are used a lot in finance. So, that's, again, I strongly recommend on on Porter's Five Forces, you can actually buy the book by Michael Porter. Or there are plenty of YouTube. Almost every college covers Porter's Five Forces somewhere in one of their classes. And you can do an online class and, and see it. Uh, or go to Wikipedia, they do a pretty good job of covering it. Extremely important concept. And then the idea of economic moats, I've not seen a book on economic moats, but I have I have heard some really good podcasts on economic moats. Um, I purchased one book that had maybe a chapter on it, so it's not as well written about as, as Michael Porter's Five Forces. But they're both very powerful to know. Right now, economic moats is probably the more topical um, subject to bring up in an interview. It just sounds more sophisticated because everybody has Michael Porter's five forces. Economic moats is probably a pre pretty rare item that's brought up in an interview and, and they would be impressed if you knew the concept. There's a lot of overlap in the two. Uh, I actually have a book by Michael Porter that's actually autographed by him. One of my former students met him at a book signing. He's very well known. He's involved in a lot of things. Um, he um, he has theories that help you think about problems, whether or not they, they implement exactly perfectly or not, uh, to me is not as important as the fact that he helps you organize your thoughts, think about industries and companies, and if your management actually thinking about strategies that fix the company. So I think it's important stuff. So let's, let's do a quick run through. So make sure if you don't get exposed to Porter, you at least this one time will see it. And then if you do get exposed to Porter, maybe in your capstone class or in your strategy class, you can go deeper than what we do here and make sure you know this stuff. There are certain things you should just really know when you graduate. And Porter's Five Forces, Porter's Generic Strategies, Generic Strategies, and the concept of economic modes, that's something you should know when you graduate because you see it a lot. I don't care what your major is, it applies to practically every field. So Porter says there's five forces and what these five forces do is they determine the attractiveness or unattractiveness of an industry. So his five forces are focused on industries. When we do economic moats, the focus there is more on specific on companies. Uh, but here, Porter's five forces is on industry. And so he has the five forces are first threat and new entrants. An industry where new companies can come in easily is a very unattractive industry because it creates more you know, more competitors. So competitors can come in easily, increases competition, reduces margins. That is an unattractive industry. Industries where uh, there's there's barriers to entry, so new entrants can't get in, uh, that's a more attractive industry. Rivalry within the industry is somewhat related because if an industry has a lot of new competitors coming in and there's a lot of rivalry, so they're competing with each other, there's intense competition. So that's going on right now in banking, uh, probably going on in retail right now pretty heavily. Maybe some of that is starting to happen with energy, given how low oil prices are. You have people fighting for survival, fighting for market share. They, they fight by reducing margin, reducing prices to try to attract more customers. And it's really a, a, a battle of who survives and who doesn't survive. So that's not a good industry. That's not gonna be a fast growing industry. The next one he talks about is supplier power. An industry is under, unattractive if suppliers have a lot of power over the industry. Maybe there's one supplier that is the only one that supplies that particular input to the industry, and that makes that industry very unattractive because that supplier can essentially dictate. Uh, and if you know if they were to pull their product away, it could cause major disruption to the industry. Yeah, that would be uh, an unattractive industry. Buyer power on the other side is the industry has buyers that are extremely powerful and they can dictate prices or they can easily switch to other suppliers. 
If they don't like the pricing, that's not a good industry. So retail tends to be an area where buyer power is pretty weak. There's a lot of buyers. You can compete. You can differentiate yourself. Uh, there's room for a lot of players. Um, defense contractors like Boeing, Airbus, uh, General Dynamics, you have one big buyer, the U.S. government, and that does cause some issues. Um, it can be helpful, too, like Boeing. Boeing gets some advantages over Airbus because U.S. legislatures might say buy American versus buy, buy European. But still, if your buyers are concentrated and they have a lot of power, that's unattractive for an industry. All right, so the first one was threat of, threat of new entrants. So there your issue is, does your industry have barriers to entry? Things like large economies of scale, patent, re patent requirements. Um, you know, you, we'll talk when we get to economic modes, there's several more of these. How, how much rivalry there is within industry, intense competition is not good. How powerful are the suppliers? How, how powerful are the buyers? And then finally, the threat of substitutes. So y'all have seen with milk, you've probably seen the news that milk is declining quite dramatically. We just saw a major producer of milk going out of business. A lot of people have stopped drinking milk, even milk products, and more and more are moving to uh, almond milk or soy milk. That's a threat of substitutes. Uh, autonomous vehicles, cars that drive without a driver, that could be a huge threat to the auto manufacturing industry because instead of people buying cars, they might just use rideshare. It could threaten uh, the airlines industry. Why? Why get a plane to Dallas from San Antonio if you can just jump in a driverless car uh, at 10 p.m., lay down, go to sleep, sleep on your whole drive to Dallas, and so you're sleeping the entire six hours. You get there, the driverless car, you still got it, and they drive you around the city, and it'd probably be one-third the cost of airlines. You know, So there's places that are a huge threat of substitutes in many industries. The industry is unattractive if, if another industry outside the industry can come in and essentially replace that product. Um, there's a lot of examples of that, especially now with artificial intelligence and all kinds of things that are happening that, you know, online is essentially a threat of substitution for for box, the old box stores. And, you know, so there's a lot of examples of this. Um, so if customers are unsatisfied, a new product will come along. Now, I've, I've talked about uh, Christensen and his books on disruptive innovation. And that really fits in here. How can you see a new industry that's disrupting an old industry? And his, his books give you great insights and great tools to use to see that an industry is being disrupted. So all this stuff I'm talking about, you bring it all together. You read these books. You, you write down their ideas, know what they're saying. You organize it. And, you, and a lot of this you can do without actually even reading your books. You can just type in the topics of Porter's Five Forces, Porter's generic strategies, economic moats, and disruptive innovations, and just read the Wikipedia and watch some YouTubes, and you can, in much shorter time, have a good collection of ideas where if you put them together, you will sound far more intelligent than the average undergraduate student. This is what firms worry about because this affects their growth and their viability going forward. You'll often see uh, Porter's Five Forces drawn like this. Market line is is a database you have access to through the UTSA library and they do Porter's Five Forces. I recommend you do your own analysis. However, if you go to market line and you're studying an industry, say for your capstone class or for your marketing class, uh, you might start with the market line and just see what ideas they have about uh, these five forces. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of these charts. Here's one on banking. Um, and then Porter has these generic strategies. Is how does how does a firm survive in the industry? And there's three generic strategies. One's cost leadership. This is one big firm that focuses on economies of scale. They dominate the industry, and they dominate because they're the low price provider. And Porter says, I don't know if he still believes this, but he has said in the past there can only be one cost leader in the industry. Now I don't know how if you look at Costco versus Walmart or Costco versus Sam's. Um, you know, those both look like cost leaders. If you look at the airlines, you know, Southwest is usually thought of as the cost leader. It might be Spirit Airlines now. Um, some of them are, are focused cost leadership. We'll talk about focus strategies. This is third generic strategy. 
sometimes I don't think it's as easy to understand, especially if you think about banking, who is the cost leader in banking. So some industries, it's hard to think in these terms, but um, they focus on economies of scale. They're very large. Product quality has to be at least decent. It can't be so inferior people don't buy the product. Uh, and cost leaders have to invest in order to improve their cost advantage. That's where you want to see their capital expenditures. Cost leaders, Walmart, Costco, Southwest, those tend to be the ones we think of as cost leaders. His second generic strategy is differentiation. How do you distinguish yourself from everybody else? So differentiation is you're trying to make your product stand out so you can charge a higher price. So you should have higher margins, higher gross margins. It can be product quality, durability, the product features, functionality, the service you provide, the support. Brand name can be a differentiation. So someone goes to the store and they need to buy something and there's all these detergents and they've seen 20 commercials on Tide and they don't have time to sit there and, and figure out what's the best product. And Tide's only 40 cents more expensive than say the, uh, the, uh, the off brand. Just buy Tide, it's safe. You know it works. It's got, you know, if it didn't work, it wouldn't have been around so long. So brand image can provide a, an extra uh, price premium. The product can't be, um, can't make it so much expensive that it really raises the price a lot. In fact, if you're spending five more, five dollars more on your product to differentiate it, but you can only raise your prices three dollars, that's not going to work. You need to spend five dollars to differentiate it so you can charge seven dollars. And so that is the key. There are some great websites out there that value brand image. You can just Google that. And actually, Google's or Alphabet's one to ones comes up. Coca Cola has a big brand image. Google, um, Amazon, uh, Apple, they have brand images. And so you can go to those websites and they'll actually show you. And it's, it's actually pretty simple. You've already done this. In the first paper, we talked about gross margin. The way you calculate brand image is you take how much higher their gross margin is versus competitors, and you take the present value of that over, say, the, the next 50, 100 years. And the present value of that higher gross margin is the value of the brand. Um, differentiators, they must invest in order to preserve their uniqueness. Whatever it is that makes them the unique, that's where their capital expenditures should be. And then focus is essentially cost leaders are differentiators, but on very niche markets, sub-segments. Again, if you read Christensen and his idea of disruptive innovation, most disruptive innovation starts off as a focus strategy. A focused cost leader like Spirit Airlines, I think, and some of the regional airlines fall in that category. Our focus differentiation, it's a firm that finds a niche that's just not getting served well by the main competitors, and they, they take care of that particular niche, and then they start moving up and expanding, and they become a, a major disruptor. They must understand their, their niche market, and they don't want to expand so quickly because one, one of the problems with expanding too quickly is that the major competitors start noticing you too early and they go after you to try to shut you down. And so you don't, you don't want that kind of uh, attention. So there's, there's Porter. So I'm going to break for a second here and, and uh, um, I'll bring up something, another file I want to show you. And then I want to walk through economic notes, which you're going to find has some overlap with Porter. All right, so <clears throat> what I wanted to show you was my, my, the, the podcasts I really like the best on this concept of economic moats. You can see the, um, the link investorfieldguide.com slash Dorsey, D-O-R-S-E-Y. Um, I'll, I'll bring that in to the presentation so you can see it. But it's a really, really good podcast. So I would recommend right after watching this particular um, this class that you might uh, just go out and listen to this podcast since it's fresh on your mind. It won't show it very well because of the background. So let me see if I can get it a different color. It just won't let me. So um, anyway. Really good podcast. I'll come back to this um, and, and, and get you the, the, the actual link. 
All right, so let's talk economic modes. So, so Porter's approach is useful and frequently used in finance. I've heard it a lot as an investment manager coming from outside firms that use Porter's. Um, but there's been a shift in finance. You hear the term economic moats probably more frequently. Um, it's something that an economic moats give the company pricing power. It's some structural nature of the business that separates it from its compeers. Uh, it insulates the firm from competition, so they're going to higher returns on capital. Another way of saying economic moat is a competitive, sustainable competitive advantage. Um, it is an intangible asset. You can't find economic moats on the balance sheet. Um, it will make firms look expensive. So we just talked about Allstate looking expensive when we did the last session. Um, well, it's possible Allstate looks expensive, but it might be that they have an economic moat, and maybe that's why they look more expensive than other firms. I don't think Allstate has an economic moat, but it's possible. Economic moats tend to concentrate in certain industries, and there's certainly a parallel with the Porter's Five Forces. Warren Buffett is a major user of economic moats. He doesn't think that um, universities and a lot of investors actually understand economic moats because they're not easily measured the way uh, especially academics like to be able to measure things. So let's talk his sources of economic moats. The first one is closely related to barriers to entry that we saw with Michael Porter. So patents, licenses, exclusive distribution systems. Uh, that's usually the first thing people talk, think about with the economic moat. The only problem with patents and licenses is that when the government provides protection, you're usually subject to some pretty costly uh, regulations. Uh, utilities have a monopoly from the government that gives them an economic moat but also the government tells them what they can price so what they get with a monopoly government granted monopoly they lose because they don't have pricing power they could really make a lot of money if they could price however they wanted to because they have they have a monopoly but the government won't let them do that <laughs> um, a distribution system can provide a strong moat but it also can uh, create lawsuits from competing firms so you have to be careful of that as you say hey if you're buying our product you, you have to buy only our product you can't buy competitor products yeah courts don't don't like that um, so licenses patents contracts they do provide protection but they also can con contain con restrictions and they can limit the firm's ability to sustain returns so they're not they're not the ideal economic moat the second economic moat, and probably the one that used to be the most popular and most well-known was brand identity. You can do brand out identity by just creating status for the buyer. So Tiffany and Company, I know they're, uh, they've been bought out at, by another firm, but Tiffany, the Tiffany box, people were willing to pay a lot of extra just to have that Tiffany box because it was looked at as a high quality product. And even if it wasn't, even if Tiffany's jewelry is no better than uh, any other firm's, um, just the fact that someone has that Tiffany box, people are willing because it's just the status. They don't really care that it's higher quality or not. It's just the status. You can have brand identity because of the trust. So Moody's is a rating agency. And because they can prove that historically their ratings have been very accurate, that creates trust with buyers. So people tend to trust Moody's and S&P's ratings more than upstart firms. So it's hard for other firms to compete against that because they have so much history. And then the third type of brand identity is it reduces buyer search time. You know Tide, you know Kellogg's, you don't have to do much research. You've had it since you were a kid. Your parents used it, whatever. These are low cost items. Why spend four hours standing in the aisle at the grocery store trying to figure out what's the best one? Just grab a box of Kellogg cereal and you're, you're fine and you're willing to pay an extra 15, 20 cents just to save you that time having to figure out. You don't want to buy some off-brand name and you get home. I've done that with HEB brands. Um, I'll buy a cheaper one. Sometimes I can't tell a difference. It's perfectly fine. Sometimes it just tastes horrible and I've wasted my money. So, you know, to save time, just buy the brand name and, and you're good. Uh, brand identity, those firms should focus on product recognition. That's what their brand is, whether you're Nike or Kellogg's. Brand identity used to be very powerful. It's become less powerful because today we have these people called influencers. 
that is a, some type of a video goes viral and some celebrity kind of pushes a new product and suddenly everybody's buying that new product. Uh, that that was not true in the 60s and 70s, 80s and 90s. That's really not even in the 2000s. It's really just the last five or so years where people can establish brands very quickly online by by getting by going viral. Um, so brand identity, brand recognition, brand identity is really struggling in this environment. Um, maintaining that product differentiation becomes extremely expensive. There's so many different avenues, you know, people no longer just watch TV, so you've got to be on Facebook, you've got to be on Twitter, you've got to be on the internet and have Google searches as well as TV, as well as radio. It's just really hard to maintain that product differentiation. So you see firms like Toys R Us going under, or Sears, just they just that brand recognition just doesn't mean as much anymore. Um, it's possible that perception is all you need. So Tiffany might be in that category. Their jewelry may not really all be that high quality versus others, but uh, they need to somehow maintain that perception. So that's a risk of someone else buying Tiffany's and they may actually destroy that, that higher quality perception. Another economic moat source is switching costs. Uh, I saw this a lot at USA. Oracle, man, if you talk to IT people at firms, many of them hate Oracle. Oracle can be a really tough firm to deal with. They're not known for being friendly to their customers. They're somewhat a monop monopoly. And Oracle knows that if you're going to switch to um, another brand, it's going to be real expensive. I remember at USA, we were researching, it wasn't Oracle product, but it was an uh, investment uh, accounting product. And the competitor was probably slightly better and about the same cost, so it made sense to switch. But if we had switched, we accountants, I was an accountant at the time, we would have been spending hours and hours and hours of overtime switching to the new product. And since it was close, we said, you know what, close, a tie goes to the firm we're currently using. We don't want to go through all this hassle of having to switch to a new software package. So that's switching costs. Switching costs can be a powerful protector. Adobe has that, especially with desktop publishing. Uh, there, there are some other firms that are in that category. They can be taken out uh, with a new competitor, but the new competitor better be extremely superior. Um, so the competitor product better just be just a night and day difference. So Salesforce is certainly starting to cut into Oracle's business. And IT people do tend to like working with Salesforce more than Oracle. Oracle, um, So Oracle needs to focus their reinvestment on the quality and functionality of their product. They need to make sure their product stays at least equal to Salesforce. As long as they're equal, they got an advantage because people won't want to switch. But as Salesforce products start looking slightly better, people will make the leap. I try to get that in this picture. We'll try to make the leap to the new competitor. It's painful to make the leap. But if the advantage of the competitor is strong enough, people will eventually do that. All right, I'm, I'm going to freeze it here because this video is getting a little long. And when we come back, we're going to come back and talk about the most important economic moat today, which is a very f recent one coming with firms like Facebook and Google and eBay and Amazon. So we'll start there in the next session.